everyone is at risk when they're online. But there are simple security measures that you can implement that make it more difficult to be hacked. Today's guest is Lisa Plegmeyer. Lisa is the Interim Executive Director for the National Cybersecurity Alliance. She has held executive roles with Ford Motor Company, InfoSec, and Media Pro. She is also a frequent speaker at major events, including RSA, Gartner, and SANS. Lisa is a thought leader and industry advocate for innovative security training and awareness programs. I'm your host, Chris Parker, and this is the Easy Prey Podcast. Lisa, thank you so much for coming on the Easy Prey Podcast today. Thanks for having me, Chris. You're welcome. Can you give myself and the audience a little bit about your background, what you do, and why you do it? Well, hi, I'm Lisa Plagemeyer. I'm the Executive Director of the National Cybersecurity Alliance. And um, we're on a mission um, to, to enable a more secure, interconnected world. So we're all connected these days, um, and that has risk to it, right? Um, we're, our, our mission is to educate people. Um, not just security professionals, but the general public, people like my mom and my kids and people who are just trying to get through their day without um, getting scammed in some way or, or getting a malware infection on their computer or on their phone. Um, we're, we're really there to help people navigate um, technology in a way that's, that keeps them safe and secure. That's awesome. Was there a, like a precipitating event in your life which got you interested in cybersecurity? Oh yeah, I got like it chose me. I didn't. I didn't choose it. Um, I was. I was happily working in the marketing department um, of an automotive technology provider. I, um, I started my career in sales and marketing with Ford Motor Company, and um, just really liked working in you know managing a big global brand, an iconic brand like that, and doing advertising, fun stuff like that. And I love cars, and um, and that turned into a career into in the technology space but still in automotive and i worked for a company that had half a billion consumer records to to protect you know so when you go to a car dealership and you sit in the finance office you give them your social security number and your driver's license and your co-signers information and your address and all all this personal information um that was in our system and the chief security officer wanted to start doing some thought leadership around um around security uh, about the time the Jeep hack happened um, and uh, Nissan had a data breach and we were seeing car dealers have their bank accounts wiped out and all these terrible things were happening. And we thought well, we can go out and do um, workshops for dealers on how to protect their businesses and talk to some of the manufacturers about what they're doing. The connected car was a mm -hmm. new thing. And, um, and then that company got spun off from our corporate parent. And, um, so I was, he asked me to join the security team and I said, well, I'm a marketing person. Like, what are you going to do with me on the security team? He said, well, we need somebody to run a training and awareness program. And I said, what's that? He said, you know, that's stuff that our corporate parent made us do once a year. And, and he said, and I want your name to be on it. We're going to humanize ourselves in the security team. Like it's nothing's going to say like from the security department who, you know, spies on you in the background. It's going to be like, we're going to be human beings and everything that comes from our department is going to have a name on it. And I said, well, if my name's going to be on it. I don't want to do that stuff. People, I hate that stuff. So um, he was fantastic. He, he gave me enough budget to work with a creative agency um, out of Portland, which I was used to doing, working with ad agencies in the past. And we just did some really crazy, funky stuff that went viral through the company. And um, people, I'll never forget, one of the campaigns I did was a series of short videos. It was a, a game show. Uh, the game show host was Pavel Dragunov from Bulkrania. <laughs> and um, he couldn't decide if he was um, charming or furious, depending on <laughs> what answers you gave him and the, the, pan the game show uh, contestants gave him. Um, but the game show was called Do Yes or Do No. And um, and so I had people in the company who a couple times this happened, they they pinged me on instant messaging and said, I missed an episode. Can you tell me where to go find those? And they were all about security, but they were entertaining, you know. So um, so just to have somebody, you know, ask you to to, you know, I want to watch more security videos, like said nobody ever, right? So, so <laughs> We had we had a we had a ton of fun and um, I did communications on incident response, which uh, was fascinating to me and very fast paced. Yeah. So if you're kind of if you're kind of ADHD, 
it's great because it's like this adrenaline rush and like over here, come over here. We have to work on this. Oh no, wait, this is happening over here. So it gives you an excuse to follow the squirrels all day. Um, and it is, it is pretty fascinating. And I was able to, my role is really to translate. And I, I think I, we still do that. You know, that's our mission at the national cybersecurity alliance is to translate from what's happening in cyberspace um, translate that to, to people like, you know, normal humans right. that, that uh, aren't technologists. Well, I mean, I think it makes a difference when you're approaching cybersecurity from a a marketing perspective versus mm-hmm. a compliance perspective. The compliance is going to be this really cold, well, don't, 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 don't. And marketing is like, how do I make this interesting? Yeah, I had a VP of marketing once who said something that I I, I live by this adage every day. Um, don't feed them lunch, just make them hungry. You only have to make them want more. Yeah. Um, and I think a lot of security professionals are very well intentioned. And, um, you know, they'll write a newsletter for a Uh, an article for a company newsletter and they'll put all their security advice in there, right? We're going to tell you these 20 things that you need to know to, to, to stay, stay safe. And, um, and the reality is you should really only just give them some breadcrumbs to get them to click through, to read more content on your company intranet site, or in our case on our website, staysafeonline.org. You know, people, people rarely change their behavior because you dumped a bunch of information on them. Mm -hmm. Human beings don't work that way. And what you're trying to do is motivate behavior change. So you just you have to be a little more sophisticated about it. Is there a reason that you see or that you came up with that of why people kind of don't do the right thing security wise or don't move in that direction? Why does my mom click on everything? Uh, <laughs> boy, if I knew that, Chris. <laughs> Uh, I'd be living on the North shore of the big Island right now. Um, retired. Yeah. I, I, th- I think a lot of people, um, we have a lot of optimists in the world, right? And the reason that they use technology is because it enhances their lives. Mm-hmm. Um, and they don't realize that the internet was never invented to be secure, right? We're trying to back our way into this yeah. really secure something that was never built to be secure. Um, so I think people just look at the promise of technology, right? They look at, um, you know, how the heck did we communicate with our family across the country before FaceTime, before Zoom, before, you know, like, yeah, I guess I talked to my parents maybe once a week or something on the phone for 10 minutes when I live 1,500 miles away in my first job out of college. Um, you know, we're just, the technology's really enhanced our lives in so many ways. Yeah. So I think people just see the upside, right? And they just see like, Boy, I can do great stuff here, and and um, the technologists have done a really good job at making things frictionless and easy to use. Right? UX UI design is all about like you know how do we how do we pull you in and how do we make things easy, and um, and I think because we're sort of um, the security folks are kind of chasing after <laughs> all of the advancements, saying, "Hey, wait a minute," um, then. To just kind of get everybody to slow down and say, like, you know, wait, before you do that, think about this. Or, you know, that's a really, we're, we're going against um, the tide, yeah. really. And so I think, um, and any security person will tell you this, that it's really, really important to be involved upstream. It's really important, you know, security by design, privacy by, by design, like those are real things. And um, I think anybody in any business, whether you're, um, you know, working like a customer service organization or whatever it is, like they're like you're everybody is at risk of being scammed or defrauded in some way. And so having a security person at the table in your business to talk about, you know, not just technology, but people and processes and um, designing those things upstream. Mm-hmm. Um, it just it just makes a, a lot more sense. Um, and it can lead to a better customer experience that's also secure. Um, it, you know, doing things securely doesn't always have to mean that we're, the user is incredibly <laughs> frustrated with yeah. their experience. Yeah. It, it's, you know, I, I've, uh, Tr- Troy Hunt likes to post these on his, his Twitter feed of mm-hmm. kind of weird password issues that he runs across or banks saying, oh, you, you have to use a, 
a, your password has to be 16 digits or, you know, yeah. oh, no, you, you, you can't have an uppercase or it has to be this right. or it has to be that or, you know, yeah. and saying like all these rules just make it people not want to participate in security. Yeah, it's interesting because we, um, I mean, you know, we tell people don't use the same password on multiple accounts. We have all these real weird rules for length and complexity that you just talked about. And so the, you know, the, the, the average person says, well, how the heck do you expect me to remember all those? And the obvious answer is a password manager. Yeah. So we did um, research last year. It was our first year to do uh, something we call the OBHAVE report. We surveyed a thousand people in the U.S. and a thousand people in the U.K. about their behaviors, and it was funded by the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, part of the uh, Department of Homeland Security um, in the U.S. And then we had a partner in the U.K. and we're trying to expand that um, survey in 2022. Um, but last year's report, we asked people how you keep track of your passwords, and um, the vast majority of people said, "I write them down in a notebook." <laughs> And, and I think the second to last most popular answer was I use a password manager. So then we dug a little deeper on that. We said, if you don't use a password manager, why is it? And the most popular answer by far was I don't trust the password manager yeah. company. And that, that was, um, that was a tearjerker for people like me because, um, I think there were some breaches in the early days of that technology when it was, uh, you know, maturing and kind of being pressure tested yeah. on the market. And um, and so that's stuck in people's minds, and it's unfortunate. Um, so we're actually working with all the leading password manager companies now to drive some more attention um, to to the reasons why you can trust trust them, and ha and you know using multi factor authentication for the main password that gets you into your vault, and then um, you know people don't understand things like um, zero knowledge architecture. You know they kind of think well every software developer at that company is going to be able to see my password, you know, things like that, that we tell ourselves that, that just aren't true. You know, we kind of fill in the blanks with things we, we don't know. We make assumptions. Um, and so we want to dispel some of those myths. But um, the other thing I hear from IT professionals is we don't need a password manager for corporate use because we have everything handled through SSO. And um, if you think you have everything handled through SSO, then go spend a day in your marketing department and see how many accounts and things they're using, you know, SaaS applications, whatever, um, that you didn't know about <laughs> and, and that aren't part of your SSO. So um, so I'm a big fan of um, password managers. They can, I think the other misnomer out there is people think that I'm going to have to spend my whole Saturday afternoon setting this thing up, Yeah. right? I'm going to pick one, which is hard enough. Then I'm going to have to install on my browser. Then I'm going to have to sit there and like load all these accounts in there. Well, guess what? Do one or two. And then as you visit other accounts, like it'll pop up and ask you, you know, do you want to add this? And you just click yes. Yeah. And like, it's not as big a task, um, you know, I think as people make it out to be. And, and then when it comes to those rules that you mentioned, when you're setting up a new account somewhere, man, a password manager can meet can 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 think of can make up a password that's going to meet all those rules a whole lot faster than I can. Yeah, a password um, with a capital P. Oh, it's got to have a number, so it's password one. Oh, and an and an exclamation point. <laughs> yeah, and you can have special characters, but like not a dash or not a not a not a not a dot, not a period, yeah. right? Like, oh, yeah. The, that's what I've never, play. never understood. You have to choose from these four special characters <laughs> and only these four special characters. <laughs> Why why can't I use a different one? Yeah, the other gripe I've seen lately, and this has shown up on, you know, there are just a few angry security people on Twitter that <laughs> like to rant and rave, uh, and I'm never one of them. But um, the, the websites that won't let you, like the password manager is essentially pasting that password in there, and they won't let you on until you actually type it yourself. Yes. In the And, and I'm just like, why? Like I'm trying to use a password manager, which is like the gold standard. And you're not making it easy for me to use a password manager until I like paste it on notepad and then type it in myself and it's just extra work. That that hits home because sometime in the last week or two, that exact same thing happened to me. It's like, mm -hmm. what's, what's wrong with my computer? Why is it not pasting? I'm like, I can type in that field, but I, I can't. Well, let me, let me paste into, into notepad. Okay. It's pasting. Well, it's not pasting. What's, what's going on? <laughs> 
And it was one of those things where it's like, my password was like, I don't know, 32, 40 characters with mm-hmm. uppercase, lowercase, and multiple special characters. And I'm, yeah. and then, of course, like, it puts stars in there. So I can't even see if I'm typing the right, I'm like, after four <laughs> attempts, I finally get it. I'm like, oh, dude, dude I'm, I'm not using your service anymore because, like, and then this, it was the system that, like, every 90 days, we're going to force you to change your password. Which is another thing that really isn't, you know, NIST tells you you don't need to do anymore. Yeah. And, and I, one of those things that I like about, you know, what Troy's doing with Have I Been Pwned and what the, some of the password managers, they probably all do it now, is they're now starting to integrate with Have I Been Pwned. And when there's been a data breach on, um, I'm not saying it happened to Amazon, but let's just use Amazon because everyone knows yeah. who that is, that if there was a data breach in Amazon, the password manager now tells me, hey, there was a data breach. You need to change this password. Oh, that's right. that's nice and convenient. I don't have to. I don't have to be watching the news every three days and listening to every data breach after every data breach <laughs> and trying to figure out yeah, well, was I, mean, I in, was I impacted by that one or not? When I um the company that I used to work for, the remote technology company, belonged to ADP, the big payroll processor and human what do they call it? Human capital management <laughs> uh, company and um. And they, a long time ago, they started that practice of looking for credentials on the dark web and reaching out to customers proactively and saying, you might want to change your password. Yeah. And that, that, like, to me, like, that's that nice positive thing about mm-hmm. technology. It's like, okay, I don't have to be watching for everything that goes wrong. You'll now tell me when things are going wrong. Yeah. And that's, that's an interesting point because when are we going to, gets to the point where customers don't just appreciate that when it happens, but actually seek it out before they choose to do business with a company. And we're not there yet. I, I, you know, we're not, we're probably there in the financial services realm, but I'd like to see us get there, you know, beyond just, I care about the security of my bank because they have my money. Yeah. Um, people need to start seeking things like that out. Yeah. You know? Well, I, I think part of that comes back to that, the what what's uh what's default in that user the user onboarding experience and how much friction does that cost i know there was a uh there's a study back oh probably 10 years ago uh when companies were looking at 401k enrollments and they found that well if we just auto enrolled people right. people were quite happy to contribute to their 401ks but if they weren't enrolled on the day that they started to work for the employee company it was like only half of them would ever actually start participating in the 401k program. And I know it's one of those things that Google just recently changed. I think with Gmail is it used to be, well, if you wanted to enable two factor authentication, you right. can, you could dig through the menus and figure out how to turn it on. But now they've actually started to, as part of setting up a Gmail account, it just says, we're going to enable two factor authentication. Yep. You can disable it later if you want to, but we're going to enable it. And they found out the adoption rate, was really high and almost no one turned it off. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And MFA is one of those things that makes a huge, huge, huge difference. Um, and especially now with push notifications like Duo and Microsoft Authenticator and all those kinds of things, mm-hmm. it doesn't even have to be, you know, a text sent to your phone or an email that you have to go fish out. You know, those Authenticator apps are really quick and easy. Um, I'm a big fan of, of forcing MFA on people without them realizing it. Um, I think that's it, it, because it's proven to be, you know, aside from some SIM swapping that happens occasionally, if you choose the text method and have a cell phone provider that hasn't trained their customer support yeah. um, on how to avoid being socially engineered, then I think it, um, it, it, it really does make a huge, huge difference. I mean, I've, I saw an interview, I don't remember who it was. One of the major technology companies came out and said that since they, enforced MFA. Mm-hmm. Um, they hadn't had a single account, uh, uh, credential-based um, uh, uh, compromise since. So that's huge, right? That's enormous. Yeah. I mean, think of if everybody did it, like what would the, what kind of dent could we make in global cyber crime? Yeah. And, and I imagine the, the vast majority of it is, is like, yes, if, if you're a billionaire and someone's specifically targeting you, SMS authentication is probably not what you want to be doing, Mm -hmm. but if you're not being specifically targeted, I don't know that like people are not going to go through the hassle of, 
Hey, uh, let, let's, let's sim swap Lisa's mom and see if we can get, right. uh, you know, that, oh, that, that, that eighteen dollars <laughs> out of her bank account. You know, <laughs> <laughs> have you met my mom? <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> yeah, but, but um, it's like they're not going to go after random people because not that they won't, but to me, it's like there's this there's this mentality of either you have to use them that if you're not using the hardest, most sophisticated security, right. then you just shouldn't use anything. <laughs> so you, you asked earlier about security folks, you know, with this laundry list of things that people need to do. So, so you touched on one of them. One of them is like, it doesn't always have to be like Fort Knox style security, right? Like we have to be happy when people take any step in the right direction <laughs> at all. And, um, and then the other thing is like, this, I, you know, the, all the discussion around multi-factor authentication, it's a very big um, priority for CISA right now. They would love to see more of the American public and more, more companies um, using MFA. And, you know, could, could, when I think about the average, you know, company newsletter on security or whatever, um, what if that's all you focused on was MFA, right? What if you just focused on one or two behaviors that you wanted to influence as opposed to trying to influence 20 different behaviors. Yeah. Oh, you got to report fish and you got to use MFA and you got to do this and you got to do that. And, da, 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 da. and before you know it, the, the reader just goes, whoop, I'm out. Yeah, like I true. have other things on my mind. This is not my first job today. You know, I've, my job is something else. My job is not security. So you're just, if you overload me, I'm, I'm just going to, I'm just going to tune out. And it's the same with um, using fear, using fear, uncertainty and doubt, fun. Mm -hmm. right? Um, and pictures of hackers and hoodies. And I remember seeing a training module once that had um, the phishing emails were depicted. You saw people working in an office in this video and the phishing emails were depicted as um, they were had like little bat wings flying around. <laughs> people. And, um, and I thought, you know what? Phishing emails don't look bad. They, they, it's, they used to look bad. Yeah. They used to have really bad English and really poor graphics and were just laughable, right? And everybody in the office got them at the same time. Yeah. You'd be like, ha, 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 did you get this thing too, right? And it's not that way anymore. Yeah. It's, it's targeted and it's sophisticated and it's well-written and well-crafted and it goes to a website that looks real, you know. Um, so if we teach people that these things look bad, if we teach people that, Hackers really do wear hoodies and they're out to get you. And, they, and, and, and we use all that fear. I mean, fear in most people uh, creates a fight or flight response. Mm -hmm. And that's not what we want. We want people to engage. So if fear was a great motivator and, and, it, and it sold a lot of products, every ad we'd see on TV would be scary. Well, a lot of them are. <laughs> see one scary ad during the Super Bowl? Like, you know, no. like, people don't use fear people don't wag their finger at you people don't tell you you're being attacked yeah you know you need to defend yourself and defend our company like people don't generally respond to that maybe security professionals <laughs> respond to that or veterans but the rest of us um that's not motivating yeah um and that's not you know you're not trying to feed them lunch. You're just trying to make them hungry. So, so what do you need to tell them to kind of pull them in and get them interested and get them to, to eventually change their behavior? Yeah. It, it, and before we were recording, we were talking about like, it also sets up this false impression of if you see someone walk through the front door in a hoodie, you know, he's a hacker. <laughs> yeah. Or uh, he's got a, a sweatshirt with, a skull and crossbones. I mean, he's carrying a hat. A trench coat. Like, yeah. French coat with a hat on. Like, don't let this person tailgate behind you into the office. Well, guess what? The person who's trying to tailgate behind you into the office, who's, who's maybe there for nefarious purposes is just going to look like everybody else. Yeah. I, I, I am. Um, I was working with a graphic artist a couple of years ago, a designer, uh, who's just a really, really, really smart designer. And, and we dreamt up this idea for a campaign that I think might actually come true this year. We just, we were kind of joking around with it, but I think it's something we really need to do. Um, I want to start sort of a like hashtag no more hackers and hoodies. I would love the media to stop using this or stop using like close-ups of motherboards yeah. and like fiber optic net networks and, close-ups of keyboards and like hands reaching through the screen to, to come take your credit card out of your wallet and things like that. Like all these images that are just very funny. And um, anyway, his idea was uh, to have like a 
a picture of a girl, you know, on a beach, uh, just walking the beach, you know, totally serene uh, picture of somebody enjoying their vacation. And the, and the caption would be something like, I paid for this vacation by, you know, fishing your grandmother or, you know, I mean, you could do a million different, you know, just a guy walking down the street and then some caption about, you know, you know, today, you know, I have my day job, but last night I did blah, blah, blah. Like, you know, I sent ransomware to your, to your company, <laughs> like whatever it is, because, because that's the reality is that these are, you know, everyday people in criminal organizations. There are other human beings just like us. And they, they, I think, um, there's something out right now on the, on the internet called the Conti leaks. Conti is a ransomware organization. Um, in Eastern Europe, and um, somebody has leaked their um, internal communications, their instant messages to, to each other, and it's really been quite entertaining to read because they, you know, they complain about so and so got promoted. How come I didn't get promoted? And like, <laughs> I did you get a raise? Like, they complain about the same things that you know. Their sort of office gossip is sounds just like us. Well, guess what? It's because they are just like us. They just happen to be <laughs> cyber criminals, right? But that's the whole point of organized crime is that it's it's an organization, just like we work in organizations and um, and it's divided in, into departments and and people with different skill sets, just like we have in our organizations. And so I think when you show that picker, picture of a hacker in a hoodie, that gives the general public the impression that there's, you know, like, you know, some some guy in, in, in a basement somewhere or in a warehouse you know by himself in the dark yeah just kind of trying to guess your password and and it's so much more sophisticated than that you know we're we're up against we're up against a machine um and and that's when you realize like okay then just changing that one digit at the end of my password for every new password like that's not gonna cut it anymore yeah i mean that that's to me that was the interesting thing in talking with a couple of guys like uh, jim browning who does uh, scam baiting on YouTube. And I don't necessarily approve of the tactics that some of these guys use, but to me, it was really interesting that these organizations are run like a, like a call center that it's, mm -hmm. Oh, you, you know, you're not bringing in enough revenue. So we're going to put you on a performance enhancement program and, and you sit with, you know, with Bob here and figure out how he's, mm -hmm. how he's getting so much money from people. But if, but if you don't improve, you're out. And it's yep. like, okay, this is not, this is, this is not some lone guy, you know, lone guy in the basement in a hoodie in the dark. This is an organization that has training, training books and program. Yep. And they've got someone, you know, who's tries to figure out how do we make our, our business run smoother? How do we, how do we get people to, to, to steal more effectively, to identify yeah, which people? More, how are we more efficient? <laughs> and, yeah. And to me, that's like, I think to me, that kind of set off this, like the epiphany of like, oh my gosh, like, the, the, this is a this is uh, i don't even like to use like organized crime because i think like in, when i think organized crime i think of you know it's the mafia, mafia. And, <laughs> you know you know six guys walking up with baseball bats with lots of jewelry right. on but that you know this is you know guys in office buildings and could be mm -hmm. down your they don't have to be halfway across the world in a third world country they could be down the street and it's right. and it's and they look at it they don't necessarily look at it as crime like you would think, like the mafia with the with the, with the baseball bats. Hey, we're going to shake you down. Their job. This is my job. It's a job, yeah. and it's just like, well, these people have lots of money, and they've figured out a way to justify it that they're okay with it. But to them, it's it's just a job, and it's like, mm -hmm. oh, that that really changes the dynamic of who these people are. Right, right, yeah, um, and a lot of them are really gifted technologists. Mm -hmm. um, one of the conversations in the leak is a uh, is a supervisor who's unhappy with the coding skills of one of the developers. <laughs> um, yeah, they operate on sprints, you know, like like any other agile, agile development. Uh, yeah. they, they've they've hired uh, some uh, some business coaches apparently. It's frightening. It's it's when you really think about it, just how sophisticated it is, and um, yeah. It's it's frightening, yeah. I, I I go back to the days of the mafia don sitting in the corner of the restaurant. <laughs> 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 at least you knew who it was. <laughs> you, you at least saw it coming. <laughs> <laughs> yeah.
<laughs> so like do you do you see things getting worse before it gets better? Yeah. Like much yeah. worse. <laughs> you know, you know, it's it's interesting. Um what the current events have done, I mean, you know, we're as we're recording this, there's there's war um in the Ukraine. And I think um cybersecurity has kind of gained some attention through this because mm-hmm. it's not just a I mean, those of us who work in the field know that this is a war that's been going on for quite some time. Anybody who watched the pipeline attack happened or stood in line for gas in the Northeast, like anybody who's been paying attention to these stories knows that this is a war that's been going on for quite some time. Um, and, and you know, now we have a, a war, um, a, you know, a physical war that's, that's just another facet mm-hmm. of, of, you know, the the aggression that's been that's been coming out of, of Russia from a cyber perspective for a really long time. So um, so I think in a way it's sort of highlighted um, that what's happening in cyberspace that most people don't really think about every day. Um, some some maybe there'll be, you know, a couple months down the road we'll we'll see that um, people are thinking a little bit more about how to protect themselves online. Uh, and the role that we all play. Um, not that that's any kind of silver lining. I don't, I don't want to uh, communicate it in that way, but I, I do think it's going to get a little bit worse before it gets better, before, before people take a more active role. Mm-hmm. Um, we have a lot to do in the security community to be better communicators about it, to be um, more helpful and yeah. more welcoming and, and more empathetic Um to, to folks like my mom. <laughs> um, and that's really what we, what we try to do at the national cybersecurity Alliance is, is um, express empathy, keep things really simple, mm-hmm. you know, use, use everyday terms to explain very complex technology. I would love to rename multi-factor authentication. I just can't think of a better, better word. Um, but why do we choose these things? <laughs> that's why I always say two factor authentication. Because mm-hmm. someone hears multi, it's wait, wait, wait. How right. how many things do I have to do? Yeah, <laughs> that's true. I think I think I'll I think I'll change to to your word, Chris. I like that better. So, so yeah. I have to have a password. Then you have to send me a code, and then you want a retinal scan and a voice yeah. print. <laughs> exactly. At some point, we're just going to have like you know slides of our blood that we're going to put on scanners before we go indoors. <laughs> Hopefully it doesn't come to that. <laughs> yeah, I hope not too. I, um, so, so earlier you talked about like you know if we could just get people to focus on one or two behaviors. So we talked about password managers. Mm-hmm. Uh, what would be or two factor or multi two factor whatever you want to say. Let's say two factor authentication. What would be like one more? Just if we get people to do one, two, or three things over the next six months. What else would it be? Um, so the other two biggies for me are, are reporting, phishing, reporting. If you've been defrauded or scammed in any way, reporting it. I've had this conversation with um, folks at the FBI and the Secret Service many times. They really want people to report things. Mm-hmm. And I think people have this impression that, like, you know, somebody, you know, something happened. And either there's a shame factor, like I was I was a, a victim of a romance scam or something. Or they feel like if they if they go to those websites and they report that um, nothing's going to happen, it's just going off into cyberspace and nobody's ever going to be brought to justice. Nobody's even going to look into this. And the reality is, is that if we don't report those things, um, you know, just like any other organization, they're they're looking at data and they're looking at trends. Yeah. And when they start to see, you know, maybe it's money being wired to a particular bank account that's attached to multiple victim stories, right? Um, then they say like, okay, this is something we really need to look at. There's a lot of volume happening yeah. here. These are high dollar amounts. There are a lot of victims, whatever it is. Um, if we don't report and they don't get that data, you know, you might not get um, a friendly call from your local secret service agent the next day after you report something, but you should know that that does make its way into a database that can eventually um, be a part of a larger investigation. Because guess what? They're not just scamming you. They're not just defrauding you. They're not just stealing from you. 
they're stealing from a lot of people. And so, um, so the, the federal law enforcement needs that reporting. Um, and, you know, the sock in your company needs to know that that was a fish in your inbox. Like it just, it could be reporting fish, reporting any kind of um, something that doesn't look right, doesn't sound right. Or, you know, you know, my, my aunt who's a widow got her bank account wiped out by some guy on Facebook, like, you know, whatever it is, like, you, like those things need to be reported. Um, and then the other one that's dear, near and dear to my heart is, um, is keeping your software updated, yeah. keeping your OS up, up, updated, all those things, because, um, you know, th- there's things happen and most people don't realize that those up, you know, those updates are, uh, are usually security, security yeah. driven. Um, they don't, they don't really think about, you know, you kind of think, Oh, I'm in the middle of something. It's going to force a, a shutdown of my machine and I'm going to lose whatever I'm doing and I'm going to get off track and it's, it's, it's a distraction, but it's really, really important. Patches and updates are incredibly important. Yeah, I I agree. Well, I'm not necessarily a install the next major version of the day it comes out, but security patches, I'm like, I'm grabbing every device I can get my hands on in the house. Install that, install that, install that. Yeah. That's, you know, that's when they're going to be used the most. We have some education programs for small businesses, and that's one of the things that the the, the bridge we try to gap, the gap we try to bridge, is that um, lack of communication between, like, so maybe I'm a small business, I have one or two locations or whatever kind of business, and I have one IT guy for these couple of stores or whatever it is, and um, and they don't really speak the same language, the business owner and the IT professional, and so um, so we have some training that tries to you know um, bridge that and. I think um, I've talked to, I mean, I was in the car business, so I talked to a number of car dealers who who don't really understand what their IT guy is saying. All they know is he wants money every time he comes to me. (laughs) And, um, and they don't know what questions to ask to know if their IT person's on the right, on the right track and, and is efficient and effective. And one of those things is patching, you know, and I've told many car dealers, like, you know, it's okay to ask like, like, okay, so how do we patch? What's the process? If you get an answer that sounds kind of squishy, like, oh, whatever, they're available, like, <laughs> like, how do you know, like, you know, even though you don't even understand what patching is, you can ask about the process, yeah. right? And if you hear an answer like, oh, it's every Tuesday and it's this and it's that and da 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 da, like, you know, um, I think business owners need to educate themselves enough that they can kind of tell the difference between you know, yeah, I feel like we're on solid footing here. This sounds like a legit answer. I'm going to Google a little bit so I can understand a little bit more. I'm just going to ask enough questions until, until this person can explain things to me in a way that I can understand. Like you're the business owner, yeah. right? Like you have a right to ask those questions. And um, when something sounds squishy and you probably need to probe a little bit more, right? Um, yeah. Yeah. If, yeah. If you ask your accountant how much money's in the bank account and they get squishy, <laughs> you you bet as a business owner, you're asking, well, well, what, what do you mean there might be this amount of money in the bank? No, 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 no. How much money's in the bank? What's the cash flow? Like, you're the accountant. You should know this stuff. Right. Yeah. <laughs> but, but I but I do think, like, uh, you know, even small business owners with their IT people, it's, uh, I don't know. Maybe he's a good IT guy. Maybe he's not. I don't know. Right. I don't like they, it's kind of one of those, I don't know anything about this. And I and I don't want to know about it. And I think that's, 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 mm-hmm. that's the thing that always kind of concerns me. It's like, well, no, you, in the same way that you, you may not know how to do accounting, but you want to know, you know, how, that you have money in your bank account in the same way right. you may not know how to do the patches on the router. You just want to know that someone has a plan for it and they're executing on that plan. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. That's the, that, that's always my, that's always my 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 wild card thing is when was the last time you updated the firmware on your router? You can do that. <laughs> <laughs> See, but now we're getting into uh, number twenty one on the list of things that you should do on your security. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so are are there are there some resources that people can get on the NCA uh, website? Yes. So our, our website and our um, URL and our name are two different things. So we're the National Cybersecurity Alliance, but uh, our URL is staysafeonline.org, the world's best URL. 
And um, we have a ton of information on there. We have um, all kinds of tip sheets. And um, hopefully by the time this airs, our brand new website will be out there that makes it even easier to find things. Um, and we're, we try to be timely and topical. You know, we see things like a big uptick in Twitter followers when the pipeline thing happened. And people are looking for really plain spoken mm -hmm. information. I think the most popular article, we did some metrics lately um, and the most popular article we have on our website is um, how do I know if my computer has a virus? So people are looking for just really, really simple, like help me out here, yeah. right? This stuff is confusing. So um, we have, for example, we have information for, as I mentioned, small businesses, but also parents trying to keep their kids safe with, with all the technology the kids are using these days. We have a page of, uh, there must be 50 different links on there. <laughs> We have a page on um, with links to all the different popular applications and um, where to tweak your privacy and security settings. Because those things, you know, I wish there was a standard, yeah. right? I wish, I wish when you clicked on settings on any app that it would say the same stuff and you'd know exactly what to turn on and turn off. But unfortunately, every different application, including all the popular social media apps and everything, puts those things in a different place and it even interprets some of them differently. And, and, and then they it, change the menu structures every, every few wow. months. Yes. And so we have made it easy for people. We have a page, uh, security and privacy settings. If you Google stay safe online, security and privacy settings, you'll find this page that has all these links. We keep up with that so that um, it makes it easier to, for people to figure out like, okay, I really don't want to share my location with every single application that I'm using. Um, how do I do that? Um, so information for on like r romance scams, um, online dating, uh, cyberbullying, like you name it, any kind of topic about staying safe and secure, um, we've covered it on our website. And if we haven't, you can send us an email at, at, at uh, or the fill out the contact us form on the website, and um, we'll make sure we we address it. That is awesome. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast today. No, thanks for having me. This was a ton of fun. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Easy Prey Podcast. If you found something in this episode helpful, please share a review at easyprey.com slash review. Notes and a transcript of this episode with Lisa Plegmar can be found at easyprey.com slash 115.